Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 24. We've come to the sixth trend of of the world, what the world looks like, as described in Matthew 24 when Christ returns. But as we come to this sixth one, we're coming to the one that's most prevalent. We're coming to the one that most characterizes the time of Christ's return. And, and it's described multiple times in verse 5, 11, 12, 13, 15, and 24. But it is what characterizes earth at the end. As the end of the physical world approaches, earth's darkest spiritual hour also arrives. Satan already knows that God has plans to save a great multitude, which no one could number of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, and those will someday stand before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. You know how Satan knows that? It's in Revelation 7, 9. And he knows the Scripture because he twists them even in his temptation of Christ. And so Satan knows that that event is coming. So trying to thwart God's harvest of precious souls, and to prevent the world from coming to Christ, Satan has deployed legions of liars. I've said this many times. Satan is not primarily working, you know, in the, you know, the, the, organized crime scene, uh, the red light district, and, and all the crack houses. That's not the primary place that Satan works. In, in human flesh keeps that all running without much help from him. Satan's primary place of working is in the religious realm. In fact, it says in 2 Corinthians 11 that he transforms himself, Satan does, into an angel of light. You think about all these books of all these notorious unsaved people that when they have these out-of-body experiences and, and dying and coming back experiences, they always see this wonderful angel of light that's like Betty Eady. You ever read Embraced by the Light? She's a Mormon, denies the deity of Christ right down the line. And, and she had this out-of-body experience and this angel of light was just asking her to come. It wasn't Jesus Christ. It's one of the legions of liars that Satan has dispatched in this world. And I want to warn you this evening of the global apostasy. False signposts, these liars are. They all point people away from Christ. And this is not new to our generation. False teachers have been a part of the landscape from the start. In fact, things were so bad a hundred years ago here in America that that there assembled what we could call the who's who among Christendom a hundred years ago. And they got together and they sat down and declared that there were some non-negotiables of the faith a hundred years ago. They published them in a multi-volume set that were called the fundamentals. Now the word fundamental and fundamentalist is almost a disparaging term. But if you look back at what prompted that, it was all the most recognized, notable, greatest Bible teachers in the English-speaking world who came together because the apostasy was so strong a hundred years ago that they wanted to establish uh, the, the boundaries of what defines Christendom, genuine evangelical Christendom. And they put the markers out there. They published them. A Los Angeles businessman paid for hundreds of thousands of sets of the fundamentals. I I have two wonderful sets in my library, a a new version and an original version. I always am checking if anybody's messed around with it, you know, and and because it's such a, a, a wonderful presentation of the faith. Why? Because of the global apostasy. And as we open to Matthew 24 again, we're opening to what I consider to be the saddest doctrines in the Bible. It's the teaching in God's word about the Antichrist, Satan's all out final assault on the gospel. When Jesus Christ returns, remember Matthew 24, is, is Jesus Christ describing in, in his sermon on the side of the Mount of Olives, as he's looking over the city of Jerusalem, he describes to his disciples what the earth looks like when he touches down. And what he describes 
is that when he returns, there is a powerful, pervasive, universal leader who speaks eternally damnable lies, and he's backed by the most believable signs and wonders ever witnessed on planet Earth. That's the Antichrist, the false prophet. And the false prophet can call down fire from heaven. The false prophet can make images come to life. He can do all kinds of stuff. And the Antichrist, the beast himself, seems to be killed and comes back to life. And this dynamic duo deceives the world into worshiping at last Satan. He becomes the object, the God who is worshipped in this world. Now, he's always been worshipped in paganism. In fact, it's amazing to think about how, how paganism is creeping in as we approach the end. In fact, the British in the Times said last week, that the majority of Britons are now pagan rather than Christian. Remember, that's the birthplace, the cradle of the modern missions movement is the great British Empire. And that's where all the galaxy of missionaries came from. And the commentators and all the great expositors originated in the English-speaking world from Britain. And now the majority of Brits are pagans. You say, what's a pagan? A pagan is someone who believes in UFOs, aliens, and ghosts, and they believe in getting and seeking and finding guidance apart from God. That is what is called the occult. It's, it's everything from Oprah Winfrey's, you know, New Age, uh, you know, Hindu people that tell you how to live a better life. And it's all wisdom that doesn't come from God. Guidance that's supernatural. Beware of supernatural things that are detached from God. Because there are only two sources of power in this world. It's either energized by God or by the devil. And if it's not from God, then do the simple math. It's from the devil. Think about that. That's what the ah cult is. And majority of Brits today, according to their newspaper, are pagan. Well, let's open to Matthew 24. And I want to read with you, and you can skip down in your Bibles with me, starting in verse 5. Let's stand together, and I'll read about five verses, starting in verse 5. Matthew 24, 5, For many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Christ, and will deceive many. Drop down to verse 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Verse 12, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. That's a real timeless lesson. The best way to avoid false teaching is to be so deeply in love with Christ that you don't even tolerate it, you don't even think about it. It says, because uh, their love is growing cold, they're starting to believe this error. Look at verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, so there's, there's that, that one seeking to be worshipped. And then the ultimate one is in verse 24. Look what it says down there. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Wow. The time is coming when there is going to be the ultimate signs and wonders outbreak on this earth. And it will not be God. It will be Satan. And the vast majority, almost universally, the world will follow. That's what's coming. Global apostasy. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray that you would teach us, teach us to love the truth. Salvation is receiving the love of the truth. And I would pray that we would all stir that up in our hearts, that we would be truth lovers and truth seekers, and that we would have Truth that is mixed with love. That our, our defense of the truth would be so winsome that people will say, oh, we know that they've been in the presence of Christ. Now we know that we will be a, an irritant to the world. We know that we will be hated because we're your followers. But you've already told us that those that hate us were to love and those that persecute us were to bless and we're to pray for, and we're to live out like Stephen, the love of Christ, as they harmfully treat us, and that we would be 
your emissaries of truth in a growing, darkening world. And Lord, I pray that you would just illumine our hearts in this challenging subject tonight of apostasy and teach us some truths that we can apply to our walk each day. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. And at the end of days, as Satan sends to earth the expressions of all mankind's desires in the person of the Antichrist. And I'm not going into a study of the Antichrist, but the Antichrist is going to be the ultimate Superman. You know, we've got all these superhero movies. Uh, you know, it's just such a magnet, you know, to have these people with powers. And, and that's all part of the run-up to this. And finally, the ultimate Superman is going to come. Now, I don't know if the Antichrist is going to arrive in Central Park in a UFO. I mean, I wouldn't put it past the devil to do that. You know, I mean, everybody wants an extraterrestrial life form to come. And the devil is the ultimate extraterrestrial life form. And him embodying in a human is, is an expression of that. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm not saying that the devil's going to send a UFO and the Antichrist is going to come out. But that would fit our culture. Because people are looking out there. They, they're, they're wanting something from beyond us to solve our problems. And, and that longing of the earth is what Satan's going to respond to. In a very short time after this, this embodiment of the devil arrives, almost all the earth begins to follow him. And that's the saddest heart of the fallen community of this planet. The, the saddest commentary that, that everyone will make that wrong choice and not seek their creator or nearly everyone. And the Antichrist, like Satan, comes to kill and steal and destroy. And Christ, on the other hand, is the one that offers abundant life. But people reject that. That's what's so amazing. Um, Jesus Christ offers, as I said this morning, absolutely free, absolutely unbelievable forgiveness of past, present, and future sin. And people would rather drown their guilt in, in, in chemicals rather than have it removed. It's kind of like if you have a choice of, of a successful cancer surgery to have all the tumor taken away and you will have perfect health after that, or just have constant painkillers and, and, and all kinds of stuff like that, and you choose to take the pills and let the cancer grow rather than have it removed. And that's just what's unbelievable about the world. But it's part of the malignity of the human heart because of sin. When you call upon Christ to save you from your sins... God delivers us from the power of darkness and from the eternal damnable lies and brings us into the wonderful kingdom of His Son. You know why? Because we become, when we're saved, lovers of truth. And I want to show you what I mean by turning back with me to 2 Thessalonians 2. This is probably one of the uh, biggest exposés on this, this whole deception that's coming. 2 Thessalonians. So you keep going. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. There it is. 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Uh, and we're going to look at 2nd Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 1. Because today, just as during the tribulation years, there will be only two types of people on the planet. Truth lovers and truth haters. And, and the truth lovers are those who have received the love of the truth. And that's how Paul describes it. Follow along as, as Paul writes this. He says, Now, brethren... 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. We ask you not to soon be shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. They were already having eschatological disputes back then. Prophecy was always contested, and people thought they'd missed Christ's return in Paul's day. Someone wrote a spurious letter and, and scared them all. Verse 3 said, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, here it is, unless the falling away comes first. Do you see why? Matthew 24, Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, you know that it's right on the verge. The, the, my coming is, is, is precipitated by, look right here, the falling away comes first. And verse 3 continues, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. By the way, the Antichrist, the beast, has about 30 different titles given him in the Bible. He is an amazing amalgam of everything, 
of deception and of manipulation. It's kind of like putting together a warrior that is as invincible as Genghis Khan and someone that's as ruthless as, as Adolf Hitler and someone that is as, as totally uh, maniacal and controlling like Mao over the billion Chinese. And you put him kind of in a winsome, grinning, grandfatherly uh, Ronald Reagan package. And can you imagine what that would be like to just have someone that, who's an incredible communicator the Antichrist, it says that, that he has powerful words and, and he has this, this unbelievable military power and he's just a genius. He's just kind of what everybody was waiting for. and He's going to come. He's called the son of perdition. Verse 4. But look at the, what, what he's characterized by. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So he's going to be the ultimate one. Remember the emperors, the Roman emperors wanted to be worshipped. He's going to want to be worshipped. He's this, this magnet for worship. So that he sits, look at, look at what it says in this verse, verse 4. So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now just look up for a second, think about that. Do you realize that's what we just read in Matthew 24? Jesus said in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination that causes desolation in the temple, in the holy place, the Holy of Holies is actually the naos in Greek. We, we know, he actually goes in the Holy of Holies. Now, wait a minute. Where's the Holy of Holies? You see, there's a real, that's why we have such a division in the church between the amillennialists who spiritualize everything. Because if you really believe the Bible, that's saying that there's going to be a rebuilt temple over there in Israel. Because Jesus said in Matthew 24, let those who are in Jerusalem. So we already know that Jesus, in this, in this Olivet Discourse, as he's on the side of the Mount of Olives, looking into the future, was looking at Jerusalem and he said, I see a temple in Jerusalem and I see this, this man of sin going into that temple and saying, I'm the God you've always wanted to worship. So Jesus saw a Jewish temple in Jerusalem at the end of the world. Guess who else sees it? Right here, Paul is seeing the same thing. Do you see Paul is saying that? He sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul saw it. You know who else saw it? John the Apostle. By the time we get to chapter 13, 11 through 13 of Revelation, 13... The beast is coming. Eleven, there is a temple built in Jerusalem. It's amazing to think about how we are... Look what's going on right now. I mean, the Jews are fighting for their lives against the Muslims. But something is going to happen. It's going to cause the world to allow them to do something. To put up this holy place, this worship place. Do you not remember, verse 5, that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Paul's writing the Thessalonians. He was only there for a few weeks. Have you ever read the brevity of his time there? Did you know Paul, in this short stop, in this crucial city, church planning, taught them prophecy? You know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, prophecy is not important. We've got to get on the big doctrines, you know. Well, why did he teach it then? Why did he spend so much time with these new believers? He says, don't you remember I talked to you about all of this? I talked to you about the end of the world. I talked to you about the Antichrist. I talked to you about the great deception. Verse 6. And now you know what is restraining, that, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And by the way, the restrainer is always debated. And, and so it's one of two things. It's either the Holy Spirit in the church or it's the Holy Spirit. But it's probably the Holy Spirit in the church. And the church is removed and the restraining influence and it precipitates, it kicks off, it kind of takes the block out and this, this whole machine starts rolling. So the restrainer, the Holy Spirit is the restrainer, but whether it's him alone or whether him and the church, it's kind of the same thing. But look at this, the, the coming, verse 9, of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. See, he's called the lawless one. Earlier, he's called the son of perdition. He's called the beast. He's called the Antichrist. He's called the, a lot of things, especially in the Old Testament prophets. Many titles, the same embodiment. By the way, I think Satan's always had one in every generation. I don't know if you realize that Satan knows this is coming. 
And I think he's always had someone on deck. I think Hitler was one on deck. I think all the great world leaders were, were energized in some way or another by the devil. And he, he thought it was the time. He thought he was going to take over the world. He's going to have all that worship because he's so longing for it. And then God says, oh, it's not yet time. And Hitler was defeated by a few bad tactical moves or he would have or we would have all been speaking German you know he was quite a military man but keep going verse uh, 9 continues with all power Paul's describing this Satan pulls out all the stop and this leader has all power signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perished now this is the key to this passage in verse 10 because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Salvation, genuine saving faith, involves receiving from God a love for the truth. A love for the truth. And that's why I'm deeply concerned. You know why, as old as I am, I stay in college ministry? Because I'm seeing the next generation always before me. And you know what? I just came back from there. Did you know it's a little blur in those collegians' minds? They can't tell whether the Christians, whether it's in the Bible, or whether they read it in Wikipedia, or whether they saw it in a movie, or whether someone Twittered it to them. You know, they don't know. They don't really have their, their foundation in the Word. See, we're, we're really in a post-Christian society. Uh, even unsaved people knew the Bible have you ever read English literature? I mean, gross, unsaved, harlotrous people wrote about the Bible in their literature because it was a Christianized culture. But we're in a time where even Christians don't know the Bible. What concerns me, all pastors, is if born again people are, look back at verse 10. Part of the new birth is receiving a love of the truth. And I told the young people yesterday, I said, you know what? I said, if you are a Twitter bug, you know, and you're, you're you know, Twitter, I don't know if you know it. It's a little service that just tells all your friends everything you're doing. You just put a little bit in it, blankets everybody, and you can say, I'm at the, da -da, and I've done this, and I saw that, and all this. I said, when I was young, it used to be called frittering your life away. And I think you guys are twittering your lives away. You know, I mean, you're wasting your life. I said, you know the, the whereabouts of every single person that you care about on earth except for one, God. And you haven't even spent time listening to him. But you'll jump when your electronic device vibrates. God says true believers have a love of the truth and that's part of our salvation. In verse 11, And for this reason, God will send them, the ones who are not lovers of the truth, strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, verse 12, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, you know the truth, and the truth will set you what? Yeah. You see, there's also a correspondence with the church is is increasingly growing cold because unrighteousness is moving into the church. Do you know why unrighteousness is moving in? Because there's not a passionate love for the truth. If you love the truth, you're being set free from iniquity. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know the truth. You know that God hates sin. In fact, I told you talk about arresting their attention. I said, you know what? Young people, the Bible says that... that all sins are sin, but one class of sins are especially harmful. Now, I'm talking to a group of jiving college kids. I mean, they were jumping during the songs. I mean, I can't jump. In fact, they tried to have me do one thing. I'm not going to do it, but it was terrible. You know, I, I can't even do that. You know, I can't even get, you know, do those things that they do. But I was supposed to because I was a speaker, but I couldn't. But they do it. And I said, you know what? You guys are so full of energy and everything else, but you know what the Bible says? That all sins are outside the body except for one. And all immoral sexual sins are against your body. I said, and you live in, in this generation where you guys are getting this close. You're, you're kind of Clinton-esque. You say, I didn't do it. You do everything else around. You just don't do it. 
And I said, you are living in immorality, many of you. And you don't realize that God says that if you do that, you're sinning against this body. And this body is going to stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's going to ask you, what did you do with that body? And yes, we will be forgiven for all sins. And yes, they're all forgotten. Yes, we're white as snow. But there is a penalty, it says in the Bible. There is a loss that believers will suffer who commit sexual immorality because this body belongs to the Lord. And above all other sins, you know, there's all kinds of bad sins. But Paul says those that commit immorality sin in a very special way against their body. You know, and as I said that, it got absolutely hushed. Because that is such a prevalent struggle in our... All the, the, the barriers have been removed. And I'm not going to speak on, on modesty and immorality tonight, but I am going to say that those who are truly born again in verse 10 receive a love of the truth and they're saved. And that truth causes them in verse 12 to not have pleasure in unrighteousness. And if you're struggling with sin, we all struggle with sin, but if you are unusually struggling with sin, you ought to start doing a high dose of truth. And you will have a longing for righteousness and to be set free. Well, what happened a hundred years ago? At the end of days, truth is under attack and lies will abound. And that's why Paul says we have a love of the truth. So a hundred years ago, this whole thing was starting up that we see today of, of all the denominations just departing wholesale. I mean, we can't even get denominations to agree that life begins at conception. We can't get them to agree that God wanted a man to marry a woman. We can't even get them to agree that, that if you're going to have this alternate uh, homosexual lifestyle, that you certainly shouldn't have any, any involvement in church leadership. The denominations can't even agree on that. They're not only condoning same-sex marriage, they're condoning the ordination of same-sex marriage homosexual people. They can't even, because they say, well, that's Old Testament, that's in Leviticus, that was for the Jews, and Paul was mistaken, etc., etc. So the church is just abysmal. Well, it was abysmal hundred years ago. So that's why Jesus says, watch out for false teachers and counterfeit religion. And when faced with the same situation at the turn of the century, evangelicals produced a work called The Fundamentals. It was produced over a six-year period from 1909, hundred years ago, to 1915. And during that time period, the writers read like a who's who of Christianity of that day. The writers of the fundamentals were R.A. Torrey, D.L. Moody's personal assistant, and then the founder of Biola, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Secondly, B.B. Warfield of Westminster Seminary, who was one of the greatest proponents and advocates and teachers and defenders of inspiration. And then J.C. Ryle, you might know him as Bishop Ryle. He was a, not only a well-known pastor, but he was a devotional writer. And G. Campbell Morgan who is one of the masters of what we all love today, of expositional preaching. Campbell Morgan was one who wouldn't preach on a passage until he had read it 40 times. And he inspired a young man named W.A. Criswell, who inspired and was a model for another young man we all know today as John MacArthur. And those, that succession of men goes back to Campbell Morgan with his expositional style. And then there was C.I. Schofield, if you ever heard of his study Bible, and James M. Gray, of Moody Bible Institute, and A.T. Pearson, the devotional writer, and so on. And what these men did is they gathered together, they distilled down the fundamental beliefs that distinguish a true believer from a false or counterfeit one. And they boiled down all theology. And by the way, what was fascinating was you had the whole spectrum. You had the, the Moody camp, which would be kind of like Billy Graham, kind of like the evangelist group. And you had the B.B. Warfield, which are kind of the cloistered, you know, ivory tower reformed seminarians, and they all got into a room and they said, let's distill down what we believe of, of true doctrine, all theology, into the essentials. And you know what they did? They came up with seven essentials. You can tell it's pastors. They came up with seven, you know. Either three or seven are the two number of points. And the seven doctrines they, they wrote articles on and they published in a multi-volume set of books it was called the fundamentals. And now you know where the fundamentalist movement came from. It was them saying, we've got to go back to the pillars, back to the foundation, back to the intent. 
kind of like we have uh, those who, who look at the Constitution, they, they go back to the intent because they feel in America our Constitution is being trampled on, and they, they go back, they, they like that. Well, in the church, those who went back to the, the foundational documents 100 years ago, they called it the fundamentals. Well, here's their list of the seven essentials. And I think this is fascinating. And you can go down. I mean, it's probably in the Kalamazoo Library. And this is what they put in their multi-volume set and their guide, which they sent out to, to every evangelical church across the country. There were 100,000 known churches. There are almost 400,000 today. There were 100,000 known Bible teaching centers back at the turn of the century. And someone paid to have them sent out. And they said, this is a guide to use to uncover when someone is a false teacher and on a course to falling away or becoming an apostate. So here's their list. I think it's fascinating. Okay, number one, inspiration. They said, all we know and believe about God is based on his words. So they affirmed the inspiration and the reliable historicity of the Bible. Isn't that interesting? A hundred years ago, they said, you got to affirm inspiration. I was telling the kids uh, at the conference yesterday, I said, you know, I got one time conned into uh, Bonnie and I. They lured me in. They says, we'd like you to help us. A friend of mine, he says, there are 90 pastors, and they want to go to the island of Crete, and they want you to lecture to them. I said, oh, I'd love to do it. I didn't even ask any questions. So Bonnie and I hopped on a plane, and we went for 10 days. I mean, it was wonderful. And we landed, and, and I popped off the bus, and there were them all these uh, pastors standing there. We were on the island of Crete, and I said, all of you, please open your Bibles to the book that Paul wrote to this very island, to the pastor of this island. And all of them stood just like this and blankly looked at me. Finally, one said, what do you mean? I said, Titus. And another one said, how do you know that Paul wrote the book of Titus? I said, because it says it. They said, how do you know that's true? And I went, oh, my. And what they wanted me to lecture on is on cultural things. They didn't want the Bible. These pastors were from a, a mainline denomination. I'm not going to mention it, but it was founded by Charles Wesley. And they, none of them, none of them believed in the inspiration or the reliability or the historicity of the Bible. And so, you know, I, I did my hardest on, on Crete. And, and uh, we went on to, to the mainland and we got to Philippi. We we're standing in the forum of Philippi. And I said, this is the place where Paul was taken before the, the magistrate. And this is where he was put into prison. And one of them raised a hand. Oh, and I says, and let's turn to his prayer that's recorded in God's word. And they said, where would that be? I said, well, it's in two places. I said, it's in Acts 16. It's in the book of Philippians. Another one said, Paul didn't write Philippians. It was written 200 years after Paul. And I said, it says, Paul, an apostle to the saints that are in Philippi. They said, but that's not what it means. See, that's where we've gotten to. And that's why the fundamental says, all we know and believe about God is based on his words. So they affirm that the Bible is inspired. It's reliable. It's historic truth. It can be verified, but it's true. Number two. Now, this is interesting. You know what the second thing in 1909 that they affirmed as a fundamental? Creation. This is what they said. God is revealed from cover to cover of his word as the creator of the universe, just as it is described in the Bible. So they exposed in this fundamental set the grave errors of what they called evolutionism and Darwinism. This is not new, what we're into today. What's new is that the Christians are embracing evolutionism and Darwinism. It used to just be the unsaved that were embracing that. And now the Christians are. So they said creation was the second fundamental. Thirdly, they, the third part of their treatment was doctrine. They said God's word teaches clear doctrine about Jesus Christ and his church. It's not vague. It's, it's, it's true, propositional, defensible, clearly stated doctrine. And so this is what they said. They specifically named the cults who presented false doctrine, false gospels in their day, and they said these were the errors, and, and they were just bold. They said that Jehovah's Witnesses were wrong, that the Mormons were wrong, that Christian science was wrong, that Spiritism, I mean, that isn't even one that is a, one that's big nowadays, Madame Blavatsky was her name, but Spiritism was wrong, and so on. And they named the cults. Do you know where we've gotten today? In the name of trying to Christianize America, 
Christians will go arm in arm with the Mormons, even though we have a different God and a different Savior and a different salvation, and say we're going to stand for Christian values, even though they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Do you know Mormons believe Jesus and Satan are brothers? Now that's an interesting twist on the Scriptures, that Jesus, the Creator, the God of the universe, is the brother of Lucifer? Amazing. Back a hundred years ago, they weren't ashamed to say that's false. Fourthly, inspiration, creation, doctrine. The fourth fundamental was depravity. That's interesting. I mean, I guess it was because liberalism was just starting in this whole life of Bushnellianism and the idea that it's played out in America. And you know, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society. Remember that? What they thought is if you went and demolished the downtown areas and built big buildings and moved the people in, all the people would get nice and clean like the buildings. And they'd clean up their lives and they'd stop the crime and they would all become industrious, happy people. And what they didn't realize is the environment does not change a heart. You have to have a heart change and then the environment will change and the crime and everything else. And so that we were at the front end of that back then, 100 years ago, of that notion that liberalism has fanned. You know, it's the idea that everyone's born with a little spark of deity and all you have to do is blow on it and it'll flame to life. And, and uh, this is what they said. God's word declares the reality of sin. So we affirm that man is not basically good, but was born a sinner. And that was a fundamental. Number five, substitution. That's interesting that, that that is another one I think is amazing. They said God's word only presents biblical salvation is received by faith in the God incarnate Christ Jesus who became sin for sinners to save them. So the idea of the substitutionary atonement was really big. Sixthly, imputation. Now, this one is very important. And, and you know what? If I was picking the seven doctrines, I don't know if I would have picked these. You know, isn't that interesting? But these were in the crosshairs back then. And, and when you think about it, they are still in the crosshairs. But imputation was their sixth one. They said God's word teaches that salvation cannot be earned at any level. And it cannot be dispensed except by God. And not by any church or any cleric. Thus, they clearly expose the errors of Roman Catholicism. Isn't that amazing? Shoulder to shoulder, all the known evangelical Bible teachers that were on a global, of the English world known, they all stood shoulder to shoulder and declared the errors of Romanism. Did you know what? You can't even get that in America today. You cannot get the known Bible radio personalities to stand and look you in the eye and say that Romanism is a false, erroneous, damnable teaching. If you truly believe that grace is dispensed through the sacraments a little bit as you're baptized as a baby and a little bit when you're confirmed and a little bit when you do, you know, either holy orders or holy matrimony, and a little bit when you go to Mass every week, and a little bit at extreme unction at the end. If you, if you truly believe that, you can't be saved. That's what the Bible says. Because grace is not earned or dispensed by a man or a church. Now, I'm not saying all Roman Catholics are not saved. There are born-again Roman Catholics. But you know what? They don't really believe all that stuff. They don't attribute to Mary the attributes of God. They don't, they don't take the, the omniscience, omnipresence, and, and the, the wonderful, wonderful, uh, amazing ability to, to oversee and dispense grace that they give to Mary, they, that only God has. They don't believe that down deep because they have called on Christ. But the fundamentals said imputation is a key. And every religion of human achievement and works righteousness is false. And they specifically said Imputation causes Romanism to be a false teaching. You know what imputation is? It's Second Corinthians 5.21. He, God, made Jesus to become sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. It says that salvation is my sin imputed to Christ and Christ's righteousness imputed to me. And that's the only way you can be saved. And if you believe that your sin has to be atoned for partially by you in purgatory. And if you believe that your righteousness comes from the treasury of merit of the saints, the supererogation of the saints, you know, that's what they say, that, that the saints, 
And already they are off the track because all of us who are born again are saints. But they say the saints are the super ones, and they have more grace than is needed to get them to heaven. And that super irrigation, the extra goodness they have, goes into a big tank in heaven, and that tank is dispensed by the Roman Catholic Church, and you can buy it. You know, by all of your sacrifices and offerings and all of your different things, the burning of candles and everything else that you do, and that that super erogation can help you get someone in purgatory, their time eliminated or shortened. I mean, we're going back to what Martin Luther thought about. It's coming back fast. And they said imputation. If you don't have it right on that, you don't have salvation. Here's the last one, the seventh one, uh, and I'll read all of them again. Uh, inspiration, creation, doctrine, depravity, substitution, imputation. The last one is Christology. And the last fundamental was they most fervently declared that all error starts in some way or other with an incorrect view of Christ. And I agree with that. I buy a lot of commentaries. I have a lot of books. And if you want to know if a commentary is good or not, just look up some key passage about Christ. They'll either deny his miracle doing or they'll deny his deity or they'll deny the inspiration of his word. And so if you look at Christ, it's always the key to know if someone is liberal. I don't mean politically liberal. I mean a liberal person doesn't believe in the deity of Christ in the inspiration of the word and they don't believe in miracles. That's theologically a liberal. They deny those things. So they said a hundred years ago, if you have an incorrect view of Christ, then you, are, you have error that has creeped in. So they strongly affirm the deity, the work, and the personal visible return of Christ. And so the godly Bible teachers of a century ago were making a most wanted poster for believers. They showed who the enemies of the truth were. So how do we spot these false teachers? What do the signposts pointing people in the wrong direction believe and teach? What's the message that's promoted by Satan's legion of liars? Well, most often it's not what they say. It's what they don't say. And I've said this many times, but I remember when I was doing my master's work, when I was at Bob Jones University and I had to do one of my master's uh, theses, uh, we were supposed to pick one television personality. And this was in the 70s. And so I picked the biggest television personality of the day. And I'm not going to mention their name, but their church is totally made of glass. And it's in California. And so I wrote them a letter. That person, whoever it is. And I wrote him a letter and I said, I am a student. I'm at Bob Jones University. I'm doing a paper on doctrine. And I would like to ask you a few simple questions. Isn't that dumb to think you could write a letter like that and get through? I didn't think it would ever get through. But I wrote to that person. And I said, and so I need to have from you, if at all possible, and I still have this letter in my file cabinet, what your answers to these questions. I said, number one. Do you believe in sin? That's a very straightforward question. In fact, the book he wrote that year was Self-Esteem, the Second Reformation. The second question I ask is, do you believe in hell? And I said, those are my questions. Could you please respond? I got back the most beautiful letter you've ever seen. It was was on paper that, that probably cost... $5 for the envelope. You know what I mean? It was the most luxurious, felt like cloth. And it had foil inside. And it had a, that was the envelope. And I I opened it, and there was a piece of paper that matched that. And I opened that and beautifully typed out answer and signed by that person. And they said this, If I believed in sin, you would hear me talk about it. If I believed in hell, you would hear me talk about it. Thanks for asking. And they signed it. Did you know it's not what they say, it's what they don't say. You never hear them, the false teachers, attacking Christ's deity. They just don't really talk about it. You don't hear them attacking the the scriptural teaching that all were born in sin. They just don't talk about sin. They talk about failures and weaknesses and overcoming and mountains that we tunnel through. But they don't say that you were born lost and Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. They don't say that. It's not what they do say. It's what they don't say. So the characteristics, and we only have 11 minutes to get them, and I'm going to give them to you. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And I want to just real quickly, and by the way, we're not ending this tonight. I just want to start with the characteristics of, or how to spot a false teacher from the Bible. Not, you know, from anything that I could conjure up. Just what did the Lord say? How can we spot them? The first one's in 1 Timothy 4.1, and it is that they deny 
the exclusivity or that Christ is the only way. The exclusivity of Christ. That, that neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. Now, that's a pretty clear verse in the Bible. They deny that. And it says in 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. What is the faith? It's the once and for all delivered gospel that Jesus Christ and his cross and his blood and his sinless life and his perfect sacrifice is the only way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So did you know that recently, ten years ago, a theologian in a mainline seminary wrote a book and he said that, that he was walking down the beach and he tripped and he hit his head on a rock and momentarily on that beach he was transported to heaven. And when he got there, he couldn't believe his eyes. Talking to Moses was Buddha. Talking to Peter was Confucius. And talking to Paul was Muhammad. And he wrote that book. And on the back cover, affirming and writing that they gave their little okay to that book, were two or three of the most well-known evangelicals in the country. Do you know what that book says? It says that Buddha is going to heaven. I hope he got saved. He lived about Nehemiah's time. I hope someone got the gospel to him. And Confucius is in heaven. And Muhammad is in heaven, according to this guy. Did you know that denying that Christ is the only way, 1 Timothy 4.1 says, that, that they are giving heed, look at the end of verse 1, to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Satan wants everyone to think, that the way is broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven. And most people will go there. In fact, all people will go there. According to Satan's theology, they deny the only way is Christ. Look at verse 3. They deny our liberty in Christ. Uh, this is a characteristic of Paul's teacher. Number one is they deny Christ the only way. Number two, they deny our liberty in Christ. They forbid to marry. They command to abstain from food, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. You know, what is one of the main tenets of Romanism? Well, up until recently. What was Friday? Yeah, fish. Isn't it interesting that those who, who distort the truth, look at this, commanding to abstain from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving, those who believe, forbidding to marry. Do you know that the, the Catholic Church has lost billions of dollars because they forbid their priests and nuns to marry? Is that a wise thing to do? I mean, it's showing now it's dumb, but it's also unbiblical. It says one of the signs of a false teacher is forbidding people to marry. It's amazing how clear the Bible is. Uh, let's go to 2 Timothy 3, and I don't want to belabor this. And by the way, I don't want to bash either. And, uh, but it is kind of hard not to mention the largest segment of Christendom, which is laced with false doctrine. Um, and so it is hard not to say Roman Catholicism. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 and verses 4 and 5 is the third characteristic of a false teacher, and that is they deny divine power. It says that they are traitor, uh, traitors, heady, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse 5, here it is. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power from such people turn away. You know, one of the clearest descriptions of these false teachers, they don't like the miraculous in the Bible. They deny divine power. You ever heard of uh, William Barclay? I mean, I love William Barclay's books. The problem is William Barclay did not believe in miracles. He, he, he finds, do you know how Paul saw the Lord in Damascus, the bright light that was Jesus? Do you know what happened? It was the alabaster rooftops of the houses of Damascus with sunlight on them, and it blinded Paul, and he fell off his horse. How about the feeding of the 5,000? Well, the disciples had filled a cave with food, and while they were praying, Jesus raised his hand, and he backed up to the cave, and the disciples handed out to him, and he went like this. How about the walking on the water? It was a sandbar, and Jesus was walking on the sandbar, and their boat ran into us. Read William Barclay. He's a classic example of a liberal who, 
who love the Bible as literature, who taught the Bible in a marvelous way. He just didn't believe in miracles or inspiration. They denied divine power. Look at chapter 3, verse 8 of 2 Timothy. They deny biblical truth. And by the way, this is coming quick all around us, faster than you think, this idea that there is no absolute biblical truth. Do you know another reason why they invite me to speak at these conferences? Because it's hard to find someone that will stand up in front in an authoritative way and declare that God says something because the whole direction of the church is that we kind of just have a discussion and we don't have one person get up there. We aren't very authoritative and we don't act, you know, like our way is right. In other words, you don't preach. You share. That's where the church is going because we don't want to speak too loudly about truth because we're not sure it's truth. And there are a lot of people in what is now called the ECM, the Emerging or Emergent Church Movement, where they just are backpedaling on truth. They deny biblical truth. Verse three or verse eight says, Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so these also resist the truth. They don't want to say that this is the mind of God, the truth of God, the Word of God, forever settled in heaven. This is the determiner. You know what the Bible says? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If you don't have a Word of God, how do you have a saving faith? It's an interesting question to be posed to the far end of that movement. They resist the truth. They become men of corrupt minds. They are disapproved concerning the faith. Look at chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And I'll get through these real quickly. It says in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears from the truth, and they will be turned aside to fables. Do you know what the content... Walk around the Christian bookstores nowadays. What's, what are most of the books about? Are they about the depravity of the human soul and the necessity of mortification of, of our flesh and that we must discipline ourselves for godliness by the grace of God, as it says in Titus 2. No. No. It's, it's how to feel better about yourself and how to be better and how to, how to get to know people and not be offensive and how to be you know, less... Um, Less hated for Christ's sake. You know, Jesus said, all that are godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. All the books are how to avoid it by being the most uh, oblique and unclear about everything. You know, I guess if you just put up enough smoke, no one is uh, unhappy because they, it was like uh, one of the theologians in Britain. uh, He used to be like watching fireworks and fog. You never knew what he was saying. You know, his doctrine was so foggy, you couldn't tell what he was saying. And that's where the church is. That was in the 40s. Everybody wondered if he was really a Christian, you know. That's where the church is going. It's like there's not a position on anything anymore. We can't say for sure God knows exactly anything because we aren't sure about the Word of God. They deny, look at verse 3 and 4, they will not endure sound. That's the word Hugaino. We get the word hygiene from it. Hygienic. They won't endure healthy. That's biblically, biblically deduced, biblically produced, biblically anchored doctrine. It's fascinating where we've come in the church. The Bible isn't even needed anymore. It's not even preached about in about two thirds of the churches or half in America. They don't use the Bible. The flash couple up on the screen, you don't need a Bible. You don't, you don't, you don't study the Bible. You go to classes. You go to all these, you know, steps to something classes. You don't, you don't get sound, healthy doctrine. What you do is, according to your own desires, because we have itching ears, we heap up teachers that tell us what we want to hear and don't make us feel bad, so we always go out feeling better about ourselves. And that turns their ears, verse 4, away from the truth and they're turned aside to fables. And that's why, as the Lord saw in Laodicea, the church was absolutely cold at the end of the age. And they didn't even know it. 
They were poor and miserable and naked and blind. And Jesus said, you don't even know it. Because they didn't know the truth and they didn't know how far they had fallen from the truth. And the individuals did not have... And you know, that, that concerns me about the next generation because do you know what youth ministry is increasingly going down to? Entertainment across the country. I mean, in Tulsa, where I came from, the largest churches... I remember Bonnie and I went to visit the largest church in Tulsa. And we went in that place. And the first thing that confronted us was a larger than life size Darth Vader. And there was a big sign saying that now all of our youth have their own chair and their own. Back then it was, uh, I forget what it was called. It was a Nintendo. I mean, this was f- four or five years ago. I know now is what the Y or whatever it's called and, and uh, that. Um, but it was back when it was something else. And everybody had their own station that they could be blasting away. This was church. It's entertainment. And when you entertain young people with video games instead of preaching the gospel to them, do you know what they will grow up into? They will grow up into Laodicean Christians that don't even know they're blind and miserable and naked and poor and don't know the Lord at all and don't know doctrine, and they're swayed and blown around with every wind of doctrine, and they're just smashed here and there. And many of them will be like in Matthew 7. Someday they'll say, Lord, I went to church. Man, I had my own Sega Genesis Xbox station at the church. and Man, I blasted Darth Vader all the time. What do you mean? And he'll say, you did do all that. But the worst four words you could ever hear in your life are, Jesus will say, I never knew you. Matthew seven twenty one, you ought to look it up. It's horrible. The worst four words anybody could ever hear is Jesus saying, I never knew. What does that mean? John seventeen three, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, even Jesus Christ whom you have sent. If you do not intimately, personally, experientially know Jesus Christ, even if you're a member, even if you've prayed something, even if you've done something, even if everyone tells you you've got it made, Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. Why, why is that? Because you don't love the truth. You don't love the truth and depart from iniquity. They deny the necessity of sound doctrine. They deny the deity of Christ. They deny the necessity of personal holiness. Deny even the necessity of the Holy Spirit. Well, those are the characteristics of false teachers. When we come back next time, we're going to look at Peter's list. This is what he gives. The identifying marks of those who are false prophets. It's the longest list of all. We'll cover that next time. Let's bow for a word of prayer tonight. In fact, we ought to stand. Uh, This has been pretty heavy duty. We have two or three asleep. Okay, look around. Who isn't? Oh, some of you really stood up fast. Okay, let's bow together. Lord Jesus, I thank you that we have the living and abiding Word of God. And we are coming in to the end of the days when the ultimate deception, the ultimate delusion, the ultimate false teacher himself embodied the liar from the beginning will walk on this earth. And Lord, I pray, leading up to those days, the gloomier it gets, the brighter the light would shine in our hearts, that we would want the lamp of Your Word guiding us and the light of Your Spirit and the sword of the Spirit and the truth of Your Word to fill our lives. And I pray tonight, at the very beginning of this year, that all of Your saints gathered here would make a sacred pledge to meet with you in prayer and in your word every day by your grace. Not a legalistic uh, law, but the response of a heart that's in love. I pray we would love you so much that we hunger for you more than our daily food. That we would be as newborn babies wanting the sincere feeding that your word gives us. Stir our hearts to maybe decide this year to watch a little less TV, surf a little less online, buy a little less stuff, and keep up a little less with the news and the sports. And to spend that time, neglect that other stuff, to invest in your word so that we can be filled with your truth. Stir us tonight to that end, to love the truth. And I pray that you would energize us by your grace to do that. With heads bowed and eyes closed.
Don't look around. I'd just like to ask you one question. How many of you say, by God's grace, I'm going to seek to read God's Word this year? I already decided I'm going to do that. Just raise your hand. You're going to read God's Word this year. Hold it up high. Okay, put them down. Father in heaven, I pray that you would help us to keep that desire forefront. Keep us hungry and in your word and open your word to us so it's so thrilling we can't put it down. I pray that sometime we'd forget about the TV. It'd be so exciting being fed by your word. And we'll thank you for what you do in our lives as we love your truth more and more. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You should go. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You should go. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You should go. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You should go.